Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly, all streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. Frame Rate episode 44. I'm Tom Merritt. Hey, I'm Brian Brushwood. How are you and doing, Tom? I am doing well, Brian. Thank you for asking. It's kind of... <laughs> you really do care. I, well, uh, no, it, it's a bit you do. It's called keeping the flow going when you start the show. You pretend I've, to care. No, I'm it, really touched. I'm just and like, wow. Dive in Brian's worried about me. He can television. tell that I've been having a hard day. Yeah, that's how I'm doing. <laughs> Well, um, I'll do my best to make it better for Uncomfortably you joining us in this awkward introduction <laughs> is Andy Beach, video compression guru and author at thevideouprising.com. Welcome, Andy Beach. Hey, Tom. How you doing? It's, I'm, I'm doing, uh, thank you for asking, too. Uh, I just wanted to get in on the action. I, I appreciate that. You guys are making me feel for the so self -esteem, loved. But he'll stick around for the rating of the frames. Uh, hopefully, uh, he'll stick around for the big story. Which is, oh, I got Chad. Chad, Jason's out today. So I just <laughs> threw Chad under the bus. Sorry, Chad. This just in, the big story. Yeah, okay, fine. The big story is Netflix again. But it's only because they're doing lots of stuff. Uh, they're going to, I guess, uh, uh, set up themselves for uh, an acquisition by Amazon. Uh, they signed a two-year streaming deal with Discovery. They signed a deal with DreamWorks. And uh, Andy Beach uh, sent us a story that it points out the real reason that they split into two, two divisions of their company. Yeah, let's, start, let's actually start with that last one. I really like the article that Andy sent over. Can you walk us through this? Yep. Yeah, totally. Um, so it, it basically gets down to the, the idea that this is around uh, the streaming rights and the licensing issues and the fact that with DVDs, basically anybody can, can buy. It's called the first sale doctrine. Uh, and so anyone can buy and then you can rent it or resell it and do anything and there's no sort of comeback to the, uh, to the uh, original studios that, that uh, sold it to you. With digital, all bets are off when, when that goes. So uh, you're selling it to one person, but then they don't have the right to, to resell it on. And the licensing deals are completely different uh, when, it, when it comes to that. And so they are really sort of, sort of pushing down that, that path to, um, uh, uh, with Netflix in, in order to basically hold them over the barrel. So, so this is now, uh, so the whole, you're saying that the split, or the article is saying, obviously, this, these are yeah, your assumptions, yeah. but that the split is an attempt to, what they don't want to do is pay for the ability for people to stream content if they're not actually streaming the content. And so this is all an attempt to get the people who are fans of the streaming to just be signed up for the streaming and for the people who only like the DVDs by mail to only get the DVDs by mail and in doing so set itself up, uh, or, or I guess... I, I'm trying to. I'm starting to mix up the stories here because there's another. Yeah, no, 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 I know. There's so many stories. <laughs> well, yeah, it does lead nicely into this story uh, from Larry Dignan's Between the Lines, where he basically says Reed Hastings may be trying to also separate that streaming business and lower the cost to polish it up for sale, particularly to Amazon, who's always wanted to be in the streaming business but couldn't afford to buy Netflix because of the tax considerations of having all of these DVD shipping warehouses and all the 
most states in the United States. And we know how viciously Amazon resists paying tax. Right. And for those who aren't familiar with the, the perennial tax story when it comes to Amazon is they uh, are constantly fighting local taxes on their affiliate members, which means individuals like, you know, Tom, you get paid affiliate money, right? Uh, to, 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 because well, well they, um, I did get paid affiliate money until they withdrew the plan from California, and then I changed my address to your house. <laughs> now you're getting paid under the table in pesos, courtesy of one Brian Brentwood. <laughs> but basically, it's like that's already kind of a gray area because you have a bunch of these individuals, little people like Tom. But if they were to buy Netflix, it would no longer be you know this this gray area. It would be very black and white. That now Amazon would own all of the Netflix distribution centers in all of the 50 states. So, uh, or I assume all of the 50 states, pretty close to it. And then the idea would be that ne what Netflix gets out of the deal of selling to Amazon is Amazon has cash and leverage, right? So Amazon has uh, a huge marketplace for all of the DVDs that the studios still want to sell. I mean, a large number of DVDs are sold through Amazon. Amazon also has other, other leverage with publishing houses and other arms of the businesses that these companies are, are in. And they have some cash on hand. So they can throw a little bit of cash at the deals that Netflix can't because Netflix doesn't have nearly as much cash on hand. Does any of this make sense to you, Andy, that, that Amazon would buy Netflix? I mean, it's, it's logical on paper. I just don't know if it actually would happen. I think, yeah, I, I agree. I think it's logical on paper. I don't buy that that's why they're they're trying to to split it off and, and get it ready if anything i think i sort of agree more with that the article i sent in that they're they almost need to split it off in order to show that there weren't as many people streaming it in order to get better deals for the for the licenses and that the, so there's a more selfish reason that they were just trying to almost make the streaming look weaker in order to do better licensing deals than they were going to do when they were having to pay for people who were just getting physical DVDs and not doing any streaming at all. Yeah, and I, I think no matter what else may or may not be true, that that for sure is true, that it, it, that it helps them in their negotiations to have uh, only the people who are actively streaming videos count as subscribers in those deals. Uh, now, there, there's one other thing, and this isn't even in the document, although I did post it to my Google Plus earlier today. There was a blog post from Mark Randolph, and I don't know how to – is he the co-founder of Netflix? Because in I, 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 he said, when I started Netflix with Reed Hastings, and it's been years since I've been involved with Netflix, but he goes on to ruminate on whether or not Reed's making a big mistake with the way they handled stuff, and he told the story of early in Netflix's career – how they uh, they originally used to sell DVDs. And there was a time when a surprising amount of their revenue came from DVD sales. Like 95% of their sales came from DVD, or of their revenue came from DVD sales, but they knew it was untenable. They knew that eventually the big boxes like Walmart would crush them. Uh, and so they focused on their core mission and walked away from 95% of the revenue. And it turned out to be one of the smartest decisions they ever made that made them a success in the DVD by mail category. And uh, Yeah, Randolph started the company with Hastings in 1997 in Scotts Valley, California. Okay, so so co-founder would would so I mean this guy you know he apparently knows the inside sauce and he seems to feel like this is really just another opportunity to make another one of those bold decisions. The only difference being is when it happened the first time, as he puts it, they annoyed tens of thousands of people, but now they're under a microscope and the entire world is watching, and so the effects are are a lot louder as they uh, as they try to focus precisely on their target. Now, before we move off this big story, uh, one of the things we talked about when we first discussed Quickster being separated from Netflix, that DVD rental business being separated from Netflix, was they were going to have to come out with some big streaming video announcements to kind of wipe all of this bad taste from people's minds. That, that really the price differential and the separation weren't such bad deals that they couldn't overcome it if they got a big streaming deal. They've, signed, they've announced two streaming deals. One is with Discovery. Uh, so they get a two-year streaming deal to stream shows from the Discovery Networks. Uh, these are shows like, uh, what, Man vs. Wild and uh, TLC's Say Yes to the Dress, Animal Planet's River Monsters. Uh, they were streaming many of these shows already, but they get an expanded number of titles. And they also announced a deal with DreamWorks Animation that won't begin until 2013. So it's a couple of years in the offing, but once it starts, they'll get a limited exclusive on new DreamWorks animation movies after they leave theaters to stream on Netflix. And in exchange, DreamWorks actually, DreamWorks Animation gets to sell digital copies 
of their works, which in their current deal with HBO, DreamWorks Animation can't sell digital copies of their movies for a limited exclusive window on HBO. So it's better for DreamWorks Animation. It's a big name for Netflix, but it doesn't happen until 2013, and it's not really that many titles. DreamWorks Animation is not a Pixar. Well, it, it, it doesn't matter. First of all, high five on us calling it correctly with the announcements. Uh, but uh, I'm not and, sure these are, that's my question, is I'm not sure these are the big announcements that can save them. Well, that's just it, is it won't matter. What they need to do is have the perception of always expanding their content. So you're going to hear a whole bunch of these aloud shouting about maybe their middling titles. Maybe it's just codifying what already has been kind of out there. But you're gonna, they're going to try to associate their name with as many other mega brands as they can in association with licensing content deals. And, uh, and, and that's what they need to do. They need to have at least two uh, agreements like this every other week or so. And in fact... Uh, if we could kind of jump ahead to something that we originally were going to talk about, Tube Tops, the flip side of this is Amazon Prime. We are entering this great arms race that you and I have been calling for months, saying that everybody's going to jockey for position on what content they can get. Amazon, when you go to the front page of Amazon, I went to go look something up, and I was stopped by a giant letter from Jeff Bezos saying, guess what? Uh, Amazon Prime now has 11,000 new titles that you could jump on. And, and yeah, because they got uh, 2,000 more titles from Fox to add to their back catalog. Now, these aren't current episodes, but they're, you know, things like Arrested Development, things from the Fox catalog, and, and movies as well. Uh, yes. This, so, so this week was uh, sort of, I mean, for Netflix, it really was about, like, trying to take their, their control back of their message. And Amazon didn't waste any time. They just tried to sort of get in there with the knife and get get sort of their payback and, and sort of stake their claim in this week as well. So, But I'll tell you what, from a perception standpoint, uh, Amazon Prime, we've always kind of regar regarded as the, the, the royal crown of the Coke, Pepsi, Hulu, and Netflix wars. But man, they, they stepped it up this go around. They're seriously... But uh, the problem I still have with Amazon Prime is fundamentally, I can't perceive... Amazon Prime is anything other than a shipping service for stuff I want to get from Amazon. Well, that and may I, change uh, by the tomorrow. time many people watch this with the Amazon Kindle tablet. Oh, that's right. Yes. And then, of course, then it becomes, uh, I guess in that regard, Amazon has always been a content company, but they just get to get rid of the physical media. That's what they want. That's what they're racing for is they see how close Netflix is, uh, is getting and they got to hustle up if they're going to steal some of that mind share. All in all, bottom line, before we move off of this, uh, i start with you, Andy. Uh, has Netflix done enough to weather the negative effects of this change? Or do they still have a lot of work to do? Oh, so much work to do. They did such a bad job of, of crisis communication last week that this, this week was about starting the path back, and they've got a long way to go. They better have, like Brian said, I totally agree, they need like an announcement every other week till the end of the year about content. And Brian, you've kind of answered this already, but yeah, anything to add? Uh, I will say this. Uh, two weeks ago or a week ago, whenever the announcement was, Quickster was the dumbest name I'd ever heard. And already, as always happens with these names, it's dumb until it's not dumb. Until all of a sudden, Quickster now means that service and I don't care anymore. I do think that they should have done, and, and I'm sure there was some, this had to be have been kicked around at some point. They should have had Netflix and disc flicks or something. Or maybe maybe the problem is that disc flicks was too much of a tongue twister. Yeah, uh, you can go wrong really easily with that name. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, and, and that may be already another service for a different kind of movie. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to another big story. Stop everything. It's another big story. This one isn't quite as big, but I wanted to, to, to talk about it separately from the other stories uh, because it's all about cord cutting. And that's what this show is essentially about, is the idea of watching your video when and where you want to watch it. Uh, and uh, Tim, Time Warner's Timothy Books uh, was talking at a Goldman Sachs conference. He was being interviewed. And the interviewer, is, by the way, Jeff Books is, is, is the CEO. I said Timothy Books. It's Jeff Books, CEO of Time Warner. The interviewer said uh, that that cord cutting won't go away as a topic, uh, but he's going to ask him about it anyway. And Book says, cord cutting that won't go away won't come either. It hasn't arrived yet. Uh, you know what? That sounds to me like something he thought was brilliantly clever to say. And as he spoke the line, he realized he needed to dial it back because I'm betting what he originally just wanted to say is the cord cutting that won't go away won't come either. And then as he started to say that, realized that he was talking to a reporter and says, it, it hasn't arrived yet. Like, it's like this is a bold, jerk-faced statement to make, 
immediately followed by dialing it back uh, and equivocating about it. Well, and this is this is the issue, right? Is people have been talking about cord cutting for years and years now. Uh, the idea of like just not using television cable services or even over the air so much and just getting all of your video and entertainment over the internet uh, and and Time Warner and the other cable companies have started to lose subscribers in the past year or so and they are you know very vigilant in saying that's because of the economy it, it we you see no evidence that we're losing to companies like Netflix, companies like Hulu. In fact, we see them as partners. We see them as video-on-demand partners that we can sell our content to. They are another distribution outlet for, for us. Uh, do you, so we have no problem licensing to them. Do you think that this is all just talk? Yeah, I mean, the way you're saying it now makes me think that maybe you suspect that this is all just damage control and that seriously it's a bigger threat to them than they're willing to admit. I probably. think that they, they believe their own... Uh, they're, they're eating their own dog food. They believe their own rhetoric that this is just the economy, but there's a nagging doubt in the back of their minds that maybe they're missing something. And that, yeah, it, that's right. It, it does look like it's just the economy, and, but they know that it might not stay that way. And in fact, the economy may push people into never coming back. Uh, because even if it was the economy that made you cut your cable, you may start to find content elsewhere, uh, not even just video content, but other things to do, other things to entertain yourself that will prevent you from coming back. Andy, I want to ask you how you get your video entertainment. Uh, I'm a Dish subscriber, actually. So, I'm so you have Dish DVR? Blockbuster stuff. Yeah, I have a Dish DVR with the sling in it. Um, do, but you then do, I, do you do much uh, watching a video, uh, aside from work, because you're a video compression guy, so you probably have to watch a lot of video on the Internet, but for entertainment, do you watch a lot of video that comes from the Internet? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we've, we've sort of deferred, like, you know, we, we obviously have a Netflix account, and we do that, but more and more we're actually using Amazon On Demand because we'll buy whole seasons of shows and, and do catch-up that way. So, and, the, and so you're emblematic, as am I, as, a, as is Brian, of what Jeff Books is saying, which is people aren't cutting their direct tv their dish their their uh time warner they're actually adding netflix and hulu to their already existing portfolio of sources yeah and i feel like you know i mean it's it's different I, you know I'm, I'm married uh my wife there's no way she would she would let me give up uh on on sort of the quote-unquote regular cable type tv uh, because she wants the wider range of things to watch uh whereas i have very specific things i want to watch and i would probably happily cut the cord myself and, and just get everything off of the internet. Um, so, and I think that's probably the case in a lot of sort of family type places. Like there's no way I bet Brian could get rid of, of cable anytime. No, soon. absolutely. And I would, I would love to, but the problem is my dad comes over, he wants to see the football game and I'd be like, well, you might be able to find a U stream that's pirating it. And you know, that's not going <laughs> to and say with yeah. the kids, it's like not, uh, you know, I want my kids to be able to watch whatever they want on TV, but there's a, there's a value to allowing them, you know, here's the Harmony remote with your six favorite cartoon channels go nuts and they can press the buttons by themselves. And they don't have to bug me. Yeah, I think that the danger is not from us. Uh, we're probably less likely to actually cut the cord. Although Eileen and I have started to talk about the possibility of whether we could combine over the air with a media center PC to get some of the stuff and then just purchase everything else off iTunes or Amazon, video on demand or, or whatever. Uh, but we haven't quite taken the leap. I think the danger comes from people growing up uh, without using cable. They, they may have cable when they're at home, but then they go to college, they move away from home, they, they can't afford it to start with, and they start realizing, well, I don't really need it. I'm not really missing it. What, what usually drives you back into subscribing to cable when you get old enough to afford it or when your you know, ec economic situation improves enough is that must-see show or that must-get situation. And they will not only have the ability to get that show elsewhere, and in which case the pressure is off of forcing you back into it. But they'll also develop tastes for things that never were on television, things that are coming from independent sources. Well, and I know that shapes media consumption. For example, uh, Chad, who's doing the live switching right now, I know that there's entire music services that he won't... He, I mean, he, I watched him agonize over one music service over another for like an $8 subscription. Yeah, but this one has more of the independent artists, the guys that I grew up watching on YouTube and that kind of thing. You build an association, and this is part of the great... 
um, I, I don't want to use the term diaspora, but the diaspora saying that uh, of, of taste tribes, where it used to be that we had one major channel for radio, and radio was such a powerful force, it sort of force-fed you, and that's why Thriller's the number one record of all time, and nobody's ever going to beat it. But nowadays, uh, well, I didn't. I just made a joke, and I didn't realize it. Hey, uh, <laughs> the kid is uh, but, not my but, son. We are so we are so diverse in our tastes that uh, and it's great in that we get these individualized experiences, but it's tough for businesses in that they can't just have one size fits all channel anymore. Yeah. All right, uh, let's uh, take a quick break before we move to Film Falm and thank our sponsor, which is a way for you to try out an alternative service for getting your video. Netflix.com slash twit, free 30-day trial. Uh, that's really all there is to say. You can get all their movies and TV shows streaming to your television, to your game console, to your phone, to your tablet. I mean, they're pretty much on everything. Uh, so, so, Brian, uh, if, if you would like to try Netflix uh, for free, go to Netflix.com slash twit. I'll tell you what, and right now on the screen we have the children. Already, oh, wait, do you already have Netflix? Yeah, no, I should try. You know, okay, I, well, I we'll tell Andy about it then. Andy, have you ever heard of the Netflix? Uh, I I believe I have I have heard of it before. Is it do you, now? Is that wait the disc service you mean? No, no, no not Quickster. Quick oh, no, okay. thinking of Quickster. We're talking about Netflix. Netflix streams uh, movies and nothing else. That's all they do is stream movies and television to your Xbox 360, your Nintendo Wii, other kind of game console, your iPad, your iPhone, your mobile dev devices, wherever you are, access to thousands of titles. Netflix.com slash twit. Tell your friends, 30 days, free movies and TV shows. We thank you for their support of Frame Rate. Now let's move on to Film Foul. So our first story in Film Falm, it applies to television shows too, but it's perfect for Andy Beach. Blockbuster Movie Pass offers Dish Network customers streaming video and discs by mail for just $10 a month. So we'll start with the actual Dish Network customer. <laughs> the one Does, who could try it. Is this actually, uh, you know, is, is something appealing to you? Uh, and then yeah. we'll move to Brian, who would have to wait for them to eventually offer this to non-Dish customers, right? The, to start with, they're just offering it to Dish customers. Right. Yeah. I'm, well, I'm definitely interested to, to see what they're going to roll out here. Um, the quality of the service and how many more titles they can get in, because obviously they're limited in the titles right now that they, they have to offer. But definitely interested in giving it a shot. Don't know if I would take advantage of the discs or not. That's I almost, you know, I feel like physical media has been dead to me for a while and I'm happy to leave it that way. Uh, but my wife probably will use it. So, you know, I'm curious to, to check it out. And they I got to believe they're going to open this up to a wider audience as soon as they sort of, you know, get the kinks out of it. And games. Do, will you take advantage of oh. video games? Uh, I, I play some online game stuff, but I'm not really much of a, of like a gamer console game type stuff. So probably, probably won't do that too much. But, but even just the streaming part of it, if it's good and they get a good content, I would, I would happily jump on that. Now, the key element of this is that you already have a Dish Network box. So you don't have to exactly. go buy anything. You already have the ability to stream these videos because it comes on your box. They did say that they are going to release a version of this service for non-Dish customers, which would mean you'd have to have some way of accessing it. Brian, does that appeal to you at all? Uh, yeah, look, it's going to be really hard for them to convince me that there's a reason to jump from an existing service. Um, and, and again, I'm the same way. Uh, I, I like games a lot. I even like console games. But what's funny is all the console games I play, I download through the Xbox Marketplace. Or and if they're not available there, that means they're usually a, a big AAA title, in which case I download those on my PC through Steam. And it's like uh, I am now for physical media with games where I suspect everyone's going to be as far as movie media 10 years from now, where I just can't even be like, like, oh, yes, no, please send me something by mail so I can walk all the way to the living room and put this into my Xbox. <laughs> oh, you killed me. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I'm look, I look at it as, you know, would I switch to Dish for this? Probably not. I mean, they have Slingbox, so, you know, you can, you can get a Sling-Dish combo, uh, but it's still just not, I mean, it's, it's nice, but I, I, it's another extra $10 that I got to pay for. Uh, Netflix is cheaper at $7.99. Hulu Plus is even cheaper at $7.99. Uh, was, was there any announcement as far as the content that they were going to have available? Uh, it was a pretty small library. I want to say it was like 4,000 streaming movie titles. Yeah, something like that to something start like with. That. I mean, they may expand Yeah, to that, start with. Yeah. So it's, it's got to grow. And I agree. If I wasn't already Dish 
I probably wouldn't jump just for this. I'd have to wait until it till it opened up to something wider to give it a shot. But I'm here, so I'm I'm willing to give it a try, and I'm pretty sure it works off the bat on. I think there's a web browser interface yes. for watching it portable and on the boxes, the DVR boxes. So, so. They, yeah, they do make it convenient. Uh, Roku is currently my still my favorite recommendation as far as putting something in your home theater, in your television for streaming video, just because it's so cheap and convenient, easy to set up. Uh, and they just announced that they are adding a Disney channel. Uh, it's, it doesn't have full Disney movies. It's short-form content from Disney.com. Uh, but that's something that appeals to kids. So that, that's, that's something that you know, parents are going to like on the Roku. And they're also finally uh, in the works a YouTube channel uh, so that they, you can actually watch YouTube videos. And we have, a, uh, we have a, another story about YouTube in here as well a little later on ab about why that YouTube channel might be worthwhile. But, uh, yeah, Very significant. Yeah. Just, a, just a couple of new channels added to the Roku. Um, don't need to have a big discussion about that, just sort of an, an announcement. Now, yeah, here's what I'm curious about this deal with Disney. If Disney's going to have a spot on YouTube where they're going to um, put all their content, Disney has a reputation that means child-friendly, safe. And if they're going to have a spot on YouTube, my biggest concern as a parent is again, I love letting my daughter explore and learn how to use YouTube, but there's no way the YouTube engine doesn't recognize the difference between. Well, it's the not original... Disney on YouTube. Uh, oh, it's wait. wait no, wait, it's wait. a Disney channel. There's two different oh. channels. There's well, a YouTube they're... channel coming to Roku, but there's also a Disney channel coming to Roku. All right, then forget it. Then we're fine. I thought you were saying that <laughs> yeah. I thought you were saying Disney was going to have its own channel on YouTube, and that didn't make no, any no, sense. No, 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 no. There are two channels coming to the Roku That's... box separately from each other, but they just both got announced at the same time. Gotcha. Uh, also, uh, the Geeks box, uh, Google has been putting the uh, traditional navigation model in the grave, says Lydia Levitt at Engadget, uh, but uh, the Geeks box, the uh, HTPC-centric Linux distribution, will allow users to decode media on dual and quad-core systems and just uh, got a version 2.20 update that adds ARM support for multi-core video decoding. So, uh, Andy, is this, this something that, that you can shed some light on what, about the, uh, the upgrade here? Well, it's, uh, I mean, I, I don't know much about this Linux distro, but it's sort of always when all of this content that we're, we're playing around with now is basically H.264, like all the, the video codec that's powering it. And when you start getting into the HD realms, it's very processor intensive. And so it takes a fairly strong processor. And a Core 2 Duo used to be sort of the bare minimum. And so if they've got some of these lower ends, uh, and set-top boxes usually don't have something like a Core 2 Duo. So if they've yeah. got... They've got something now that can decode it and makes it more friendly for those uh, sort of lower end processors that like we're Integra used to seeing in the set-top box. Like a Tegra 2 or a TIO map, like you would see then, in a Logitech review, yeah. Then it's going to open up a lot of video onto a lot of different products uh, um, uh, or a lot of different sort of quality video without having to go out and recreate and sort of re-encode it for those those specialty devices. So the, the upshot is that somebody could take the Geeksbox Linux distro, put it on their own hardware and sell it as a low-cost uh, Google TV or Roku-like device that you could put in. Or you, as a, as, a, as a maker, as a DIYer, could just roll your own. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's going to open up, it's going gonna, it's gonna to put a pretty wide audience in terms of the types of chipsets and set-top boxes that you could play around with in that DIY-type space. Uh, and finally, this one came from uh, Angel Mercury. She, uh, Eva Snyder, who was on the show last week, uh, sent this link in. L.A. Times, big investigative piece about how Hollywood finally starting to give up on the old model and, and grope around for ways to, uh, to live in a post-DVD future. I won't go into all the, the uh, nooks and crannies of the article, but essentially I took away from this the hope that maybe we are finally starting to see the barest pinprick of a point at the end of the tunnel when you actually have studio executives saying, yeah, DVDs aren't going to be taking us all the way. So we're, we're starting to actually explore the best way to have a digital model. Yeah, and, and, and we've talked about this before, but I suspect that this is not the first pinprick there. This is the case where it's like they've been working on this, trying to decide what they can and can't do, but finally we're at the point where they can afford to mention this in public. Whereas, like, a lot of times there, there's a profit motive to not admitting what you're clearly planning on doing the entire time. And I think we're at that point now where they can publicly admit, 
that, look, we all know we're going to make a transition. Let's get started. And, and ultraviolet seems to be the linchpin, according to this article, which is that plan to say, you buy, a D, you buy a movie from us digitally, we'll store it in the cloud, and we'll handle the licensing, and you won't have any problems. It'll be transparent to you. Whatever device you're using, you'll be able to watch that movie. Andy, what do you think of ultraviolet? As somebody who works you know, in, 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 in making uh, videos, making, you know, making videos possible on the Internet, uh, is this a bill of goods we're being sold? Um, it's uh, ultraviolet's been around in the studio world. I mean, I, I think the first conversation I had about it with like uh, a studio was probably five years ago, and so it's been bouncing around now for a long time. Um, they they want a way to protect their their content while it's being sort of passed through the chain because it has to pass through a lot of hands once it gets out of their uh, so, sort of out of their possession before it someone's watching it on their their TV, and so. I agree with it to a certain degree. Like I want, I want them to be able to protect their thing because I want that. I want to be able to ultimately, eventually, be able to to buy it. And it's the most flexible that I've seen out there. But it's still, it's still complicated. DRM and and protection schemes always end up being overly complex when all they really want is content encryption or protection in some way. They're sort of making it. They're over engineering the problem. And I think probably ultimately, ultraviolet, unfortunately, is still an over-engineered problem for, for the solution they're looking for. So well, what usually happens in that sort of situation is they roll it out anyway. People don't use it because it makes it harder for them to do what they want to do, and they either stick with torrenting and breaking the law or just don't spend the money on it at all and, and go back to the old ways, and we have to wait for something else to come along. Is there any something else in the offing that, that could save us? Um. Every, all of the different, you know, what I think what will actually save us in, particularly for the, um, for what we're doing now is that we're we're truly streaming more of the content and the encryption or the DRM can be lighter there because there's never really residual copies of it that, that exist on on the, the the consumer's hard drive, and so we're not having to download it and then have some sort of weird encryption screen. Uh, uh, an encryption stream that does a handshake to, to let you watch it. We're just sort of authenticating, yes, this person has the permission to watch it and use it, and now they can go watch it. So streaming might actually be the way that, that gets it. Uh, but then I can't watch it on an airplane. That is the problem, and and that will be the tricky part. Yeah. Uh, unless, unless you're I'm on Virgin. Virgin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jinx. All right, let's move on to Tube Tops. Business Insider, uh, you know, sometimes they report things a little fast and loose, so take that with a grain of salt. But they say they got some sources uh, in the Hulu bidding wars that say TV provider Dish was the highest bidder for Hulu, coming in around $1.9 billion, beating out both Amazon and Yahoo. Google bid much more, something in the range of $4 billion, but that came with special conditions that we previously talked about on frame rate. They wanted more content for a longer period of time and maybe some other concessions that that the current owners of Hulu were not willing to agree to because they're the studios that license all this material. Uh, what do you guys make of this? Brian, do, 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 yeah, do you Out of want the whole to... article, first of all, I mean, out of nowhere, Dish Network jumping in. And, of course, this ties back into what we were talking about earlier about, uh, I mean, Dish is moving all over the map this week with these stories, not only with the live streaming stuff, but now with the Hulu acquisition, and if, in fact, that's what happens. Uh, this, uh, I, I didn't necessarily understand it at all until uh, near the end of the article it says uh, Dish was probably willing to bid more because as we previously reported it was also interested in Hulu's back end technology not just the content and then all of a sudden it made a lot of sense because if you're somebody who's in traditional media and you want a foothold not only for the content that Hulu does and the distribution but uh, but also the you know the, the guts behind it I can see that being a good uh, a good deal and it's also a, a powerful vote in favor of of the the always on streaming content, getting what you want, how you want. I mean, it's a, when old media starts sticking money in like this. I mean, I think I think it's a good a good thing. Well, Dish has got current streaming technology. Is it is it just not very good, Andy? Is that is Hulu so much better? Uh, so it's it's not that it's. Uh, I think they're they are looking. One thing about Dish is they've always been very tech sort of tech forward and very tech savvy and so the fact that they're going after Hulu wouldn't surprise me um, because they're looking to diversify as much as possible and and I would agree that 
they very well might want access to the the back end technology and and what they're really trying to get at is it's very you know doing the deals with the studios in order to get access to their content to be able to encode it and then host it and deliver it you you have to go through a lot of security steps with them and those those are hard things to sort of create and then negotiate and so if they can walk in and buy something rather than having to build it out themselves it's it's a much faster process in order to to get up and running and it sounds like from the Business Insider story, and again, this is all based on rumors and, and, and undisclosed sources, but uh, Hulu wanted about $2 billion or more, and nobody bid that, or at least not without concessions uh, like, like Google asked for. Uh, so they may not sell at all. We may, we may see Hulu just decide to stick with their current studio owners. I, I hope uh, I hope they do sell, and I don't even care to who. I just love the idea of them being <laughs> unencumbered, so that they could play hardball with the uh, with the content. It's kind of like when you wanted Ross Perot to win Maine, so some electoral votes would just go to somebody else for one. Yes, just on principle. It's yeah. like, yeah, no, we need we need a fight. Go, come on, wrestle. Uh, and just a note here: paid content does a regular comparison of streaming video services. If you're a little confused about all the changes with Netflix and Quickster and Hulu versus Hulu Plus and the new blockbuster streaming from Dish, and what has Amazon got now that they've added all these 2,000 shows and movies from Fox? Uh, they have a great uh, article up that uh, will show you the differences between all of these 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 different uh, services. So you can kind of look at the pricing and what sources they have for the videos and the the titles that they have and all of that stuff. So check it out, uh, paid content. Uh, I, I didn't really you know see anything in here that changed my mind about the services I use. I kind of cobble stuff together. I don't pay for Hulu Plus anymore. I do pay for Netflix uh, and I use Amazon uh, Instant Video. Uh, on an ad hoc basis, even though I am an Amazon Prime subscriber, I almost never do the Amazon Prime uh, streaming. I usually just buy and download episodes. Did you get a chance to look at this, uh, Brian? I, I, I mean, I went through it. I'm just shocked that you unsubscribed to Hulu Plus. I can't bring myself to unsubscribe for anything. I still have. I, I, still I paused it. I actually $8. didn't cancel it. I just, you know, you can put it on on a hold. Yeah, but there's something about like I need I need to have something I can sell for nine dollars a month because I have I still have subscriptions and fees for stuff. There's domains I haven't touched in ten years that could continue to, you know, pay like eight bucks a month for. I'm like, what am I doing? I I gotta go through. I gotta cancel all my credit cards and then only mitigate or migrate over everything that I really truly like. Andy, do you, do you did you get a chance to look at this chart, or do you have you know your favorite services? I know you mentioned you you use Netflix and Amazon. Yeah, and I actually just paused my Hulu account after I heard yeah. you say you could do it. I was like, ooh, so I investigated, and and I because honestly, the only thing I was using it to to watch was pretty much The Daily Show at this point, and I could watch that directly on Comedy Central's website. So, yeah. so I, I kind of got out of it. Um, uh, but I, again, I couldn't bring myself to break up with it, so I, I just paused it for the moment. So I think you it's just paused for Put your relationship on hold. Exactly. Uh, but I really like You're taking Amazon a break. And uh, that's probably my, it's probably my, my go-to favorite. I tend to find more new stuff there that I want to watch. Um, but I, I kind of go through the Prime stuff just because it's, it's there and I'm already a customer. And so I was happy to find a bunch of random stuff. There's a lot of old Brit, Brit TV there, so I'm surprised you don't watch more of it. Yeah, I just I, I never went there. That was the thing. Yeah. It's like they don't have the Avengers. Ah, In fact, well. Netflix doesn't even have the Avengers anymore. Google sure. TV, according to Slash Gear, set to launch a new version of its offering later this year, and they will get a version of TV Everywhere that will give you access to full-length shows if you're a paying cable customer from TNT and TBS. So they're getting the Turner stuff, the Time Warner stuff, uh, but you will have to log in and validate yourself as a paying cable subscriber to get it. So it's not like they're unblocking Chrome. They're making you authenticate as a subscriber. Yeah, that's, uh, I, 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 we live, remember we did the, the iPad experience with the Time Warner app on there and HBO Go, of course, I couldn't get to work because I lived in the wrong zip code, had the wrong provider or whatever. Um, I suspect that the whole ease of activation hurdle is bigger than more people give them credit to. Because most people, when it comes to trying something new, if it's not dead simple and works super easy the first time they do it, I, I mean, I haven't gone back to try again with the iPad app or any of that other stuff. Well, yeah, HBO Go, uh, I had lots of issues where I would sign in, and then the next time I went to sign in, it'd say, oh, you got to authenticate again. And I had to go through the whole darn process with the drop-down menu and the login on DirecTV and authenticate. It's just a pain when I just want to watch 
an episode of Treme or Game of Thrones or something. Well, and it's one of those things where it's like you only get a couple of coupons to tick off a customer, and then they're just like, ah, I got my other thing that I do. I got my BitTorrent thing. I'll just stick to that. And, uh, uh, oh, man, my, my graphics card just freaked out. I may suddenly drop off here. We'll see how long I'm able to stay on. What happened? My graphics card just totally freaked out. Uh, I guess it's, oh, and oh. now I can't see anything. Yeah, you I don't just know if froze. froze <laughs> are you, you going to have to reboot? Yep, yeah, I'll, I'll reboot. I'll be right back. You guys All talk right. amongst yourselves. I'll be right back. Let's talk about uh, DVB Logic's Boxy app. Uh, this is reported on Engadget today. It's, it's essentially uh, bringing live TV to the Boxy box. Uh, it's a new version of the, the Link client that lets you browse the program guide and watch live TV, provided you also have a home server set up with its software and a tuner. Uh, so you do have to provide that television through a box that has a tuner. You can't get it immediately over the boxer. But it lets you turn almost any UPnP-compatible device into an extender capable of caching live streams with clients available for iPad, the iPhone, Android, Windows Phone 7 on the way. Uh, and, uh, and then point your BoxyBox browser to the company's repository to download the client software and put it on Boxy. It, it, this is kind of a clunky way of getting live TV. Does this change anybody's opinion of the BoxyBox, Andy? Uh, I, I don't think so. I don't know. I, I think boxy box. I feel like it's a religious debate. People either love it or they never used it. And, and I kind of, I downloaded it, played with it a little bit and, and never, never went back to it because I kind of forgot it was there. And, and then at some point just uninstalled it. Um, so I don't know. I don't think it's going to sway anybody. There's too many other really easy options to, to get content right now. And the live TV is a nice part of it, but I don't think it's enough to, to bring anybody on, on board. And finally, in the tube top section, Time Warner Cable plans one of the most ambitious efforts yet to combat the rising cost of Sports Channel, preparing to introduce a low-cost service tier that will not include ESPN. Uh, the TV Essentials package would cost between $30 and $40 a month. President Rob Marcus says it will be introduced within the week in the company's East Coast system. Marcus told Goldman Sachs that the uh, initiative has been tested for almost a year in two systems and is designed to keep subscribers who are considering cutting cable TV because of the cost. This goes back to that economic argument. But dropping ESPN, is this war between Time <laughs> Warner and ABC Disney, which owns ESPN? I mean, ESPN is thought to be the one thing you have to have to be able to sell your cable television package. It's why we have ESPN Classic and ESPN U and all of these third-tier networks all over the place because ESPN uses them as leverage. says, look, if you want to get ESPN, you have got to to carry all of these other networks. And here's Time Warner saying, well, you know what? We're going to have a tier that doesn't even have ESPN on it. Yeah, I'm surprised this hasn't actually shown up sooner. And I, I actually thought they had talked about this much earlier in the year. And maybe maybe they did, and then it just went away uh, for a while. But, um, you know, again, this one kind of goes back to either either you want your sports or you don't. And so um, I think... I think there's probably a perception that a lot of cord cutters are guys that are girls who don't necessarily are, care could care less about sports, and so they'd be willing to to forego um, uh, forego sports uh, if as, if they were cutting cords to begin with. And so this is an option to keep those people on board. Whereas if you like sports, and particularly if you like live sports, you were always going to stick with cable because that you know the the pirated Justin TV link is not the way to go to, if you're going to be watching uh, your games. Well, and oh, you're talking got, about the yeah, story I put Brian in there about yeah. ESPN. No yeah, ESPN, yeah. right? $30 oh, yeah. to $40 doesn't seem like that big of a bargain, though. Uh, it, it doesn't matter, though. The fact that this is even, I mean, when have you ever seen a fractioning of the block? You know, this is the closest we've ever come to, to the beginning of a la carte cable service. This is huge that, they'll, that they're willing to, to, to chip off ESPN from the block, I think. I don't know. Well, ABC doesn't own a cable company, do they? ABC Disney? Uh, because I, otherwise, okay. I would expect the ABC Disney-owned cable company to immediately start offering a version without CNN, TNT, and TBS. <laughs> I mean, that's just uh, the idea that Time Warner Cable, I mean, and I know Time Warner Cable is separate from Time Warner TV, so may, maybe sure, they, sure, sure. it's not going to happen that way. But it does seem to be a big blow because, as, as we were mentioning when you were rebooting, uh, ESPN usually is like, if you want to carry ESPN, you got to do what we say. And so right. it's kind of amazing to see a cable company turn their backs on them that way. Let's move on to what we're watching. And we have a Kuhan submitted uh, introduction. Chad, do you have that? Yeah, yeah have that loaded up? Let's, let's see. This is a, uh, a submission. 
What are we watching? Crooks. <laughs> Uh, unforgivable typeface there, Kuhan, but I like the, I, I like the concept. <laughs> we're grading on a curve. You you were there first, so that you get our, you get our blessing. We'll see if you maintain your position as the current champ for the intro. Hey, what are we watching, Tom? Uh, well, I saw the film Moneyball this weekend. Oh my gosh! Did either of you guys see that? that? No. I I want to see it. And uh, Justin Robert Young has been talking about the book forever. He's been talking about the movie. Uh, he went and saw it. He loved it. And I know you have a unique perspective because you actually went to the games during I that season. I lived it, baby. Uh, yeah, no, that, that, that's the interesting thing. For those who don't know, Moneyball, based on the book by Michael Lewis about how the Oakland A's operated in the early 2000s, uh, looking for advantages because they're a small budget team. They only had $39 million to spend on salary when the New York Yankees had $114 million, uh, and they created a very competitive team by valuing stats in a world where Major League Baseball didn't value stats. They, they valued the old-fashioned way of looking at a player and value, evaluating the five tools. Uh, so the, the movie is, is less of, a, of an inspection of all of that and more of telling the story of the 2003 season uh, when Billy Bean sort of made a lot of moves based on this theory. Uh, they, they have a fictional uh, assistant played by Jonah Thomas. Wait, is that what Jonah? Yeah. Uh, Jonah, Jonah Hill. Hill. Uh, yeah. that they, they bring on. He kind of represents a few different people in the A's organization uh, to go with general manager Billy Bean and try this different way of approaching the ball team. Talks about the conflicts he has with the manager, Art Howe, and the, and the field coach, uh, Ron Washington. But in that season, they actually win 20 games in a row, setting a record, and they go to the division series uh, and, and, and play and do very well. They win the division that year. So it shows that they could buck the wisdom and have have a very successful team uh, by having this this looking at stats. It's a great movie. Having been a season ticket holder during that season, it brought it all back. They treated it very well. Uh, it really felt true to baseball. It felt true to the story for the most part, with with some oversimplifications. Uh, and it felt true to the A's. Like they shot it in the Oakland Alameda Coliseum, the the McAfee Coliseum, uh, and 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 it showed you know the grungy, dirty uh, condition of the stadium that's that's really old and shared with the Raiders. And I just felt like it was great for me as a fan. I've talked to a few other people who aren't as into the A's for sure, even as into baseball, and they've said, eh, I felt, you know, I felt like it, you know, it maybe glossed over some stuff, wasn't as compelling, it was a good movie, uh, but but overall, I, th I just, I really enjoyed it, I thought it was a fun movie. Uh, and so what about, uh, was it, you re read the book beforehand, right? Yeah, was it I true had. Well, yes, I mean, as much as the book talks about, you know, the idea of valuing on base percentage, OPS, uh, you know, runs created as a stat and evaluating players on that. Uh, it's, it's true to the book and it's true to the events, which the book covers. Uh, it, it definitely glosses over a lot of points. Uh, there's some things that's funny. I read one review where uh, a baseball writer said, I now understand when Star Wars fans get outraged because something changes and doesn't fit the universe yes. uh, or is unlikely <laughs> to happen in physics because I watched Moneyball and I'm like, well, wait a minute, that's not the way baseball works. You're, you're right. glossing over something. He's like, but it wasn't fatal to the movie. It's, it's just one of those little things. And there are a few things like that. Uh, yeah, that was the whole discussion. Justin Robert Young and I have gone back and forth over uh, Jurassic Park. My favorite part of the book was, of course, the chaos theory, complex systems, and how uh, how easily they break down. And, of course, none of that was in the movie. So he couldn't understand how it's like, you know, how he could be disappointed with the movie when Jurassic Park was a great movie. It just didn't have the parts that I love the most in the book. So I was curious if you ran into the same thing with Moneyball. Yeah, and the thing is, Michael Lewis, you know, does these famous investigations, these sort of essays, these long essays about, uh, you know, the way the stock market works, the way baseball works, the way football works. Uh, and, and so turning that into a movie, you're not really turning the essay into a movie. You're turning the subject of the essay into a movie. Uh, right. But, but, but most, you know, they, they didn't dive into the theory too much, but what they did touch on was accurate enough for me to accept it in a movie situation. Oh. Uh, real quickly, TV-wise, Fringe is back. How are you doing yes. on the Fringe catch-up? 
Uh, you know what? I'm on pause because I've been on the road so much. So I, I do have to That's I'm not going to get better either. Fringe. But yeah. luckily, I didn't even know that Fringe was out. That's how good and insulated I'm That's being good. as okay. far as the story. Are you, happy, are you happy with the premiere? Yeah, the premiere was great. I enjoyed it. I'm back into it, having fun. Person of Interest is J.J. Abrams' new show on CBS. Well, he backs it. Uh, he's not directly involved in it, but he's sort of the executive it's producer on it, right? Jonathan Nolan, who's Chris Nolan's That's right. uh, uh, brother. Yeah, is, is doing the, uh, the, the hands-on producing right. of it that that was good i actually wasn't expecting it to draw me in i started watching yep. it just thinking i might fast forward and i ended up watching the whole thing it's got michael emerson in it from lost as one of the main characters so that's pretty cool terra nova I, i'm gonna keep watching it but don't bother i'm gonna blame you okay now i'm gonna say on my watch from what we're watching i wrote i almost wrote terra nova and i kid you not last night i called because i was right working out travel and uh, and I I was just like oh I'm just about to watch Terra Nova but it's not it's real late I'll have to stay up late to watch it and Tom's like just go to bed it's no I actually answered <laughs> the phone uh, and not enjoying watching Terra Nova what's going on <laughs> you interrupted me not enjoying Terra Nova that's what, yeah exactly that's what I said um, uh, which is too bad because it's like visually it's got all the elements it's like. Uh, they got freaking dinosaurs. Yeah, the dinosaurs pie. look great. If you just want to mute it and watch, you probably get just as much out of it. It's so far, it's just way too predictable and teen angsty and and boring in places. It's sad. Well, that was the funny part. Was like uh, the reason I didn't watch it live was because I tuned in 15 minutes late, and of everything I saw in the previews, the most engaging stuff was the stuff on the polluted, destroyed Earth. And I was like, well, I want to see all that stuff. So I was holding off until I could get the whole thing, and then uh, and then you told me not even to bother. So now I'm sad. Uh, it may get better. These things happen, you know, where the pilot absolutely just reeks and then they start to hit their stride later. So I'm going to keep watching it and I'll report back. Uh, Pan Am, I thought was good, actually. It was fun. It's not nearly as much like Mad Men as I expected. Oh, really? I, I mean, it's set in the 60s, it. but yeah, it's a different tone. But it's, it's, uh, is it more lighthearted? Yes, or, it is. Or? Well, it's, it's, it's more about the world uh, and it's about the characters and one of there's a little spy story a little love story but it's not this like you know gloom and doom impending furrowed brow uh, you know meditating on the condition of humanity it's it's, it's more lighthearted than Mad Men in that yeah, the marketing makes it look uh, lighthearted I'm almost picturing kind of a Melrose place in the 1960s in the skies yeah think, think Bobby Darren not beatnik jazz okay <laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> Did you watch uh, it, Andy? And, uh, uh, I have it taped. I haven't watched it okay, yet. Okay, cool. So. Uh, and then just uh, just a note that coming up, uh, we have Doctor Who's finale of season six uh, this Saturday on BBC and BBC America and uh, Warehouse 13 finale on Monday. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, watching, uh, dude, the return of Always Sunny in Philadelphia is amazing. Uh, they, if you don't know, one of the main characters, uh, Mac, has gained 50 pounds of real fat on his body just because the actor thought that would be funny this year. That is it's, hilarious. Like, he just did it for kicks. He wasn't ordered to do it or anything, right? No, he's just like, you know what would be funny? Is if I was just really fat this season and go. That's what they did. And, uh, you know, and in fact, there's some behind-the-scenes featurettes that people are, uh, you can find if you Google, Always Sunny, Fat Mac, and you'll find them. Uh, but uh, very, it's such a great show, and I got to get you hooked into it. It's one of those that you watch one episode, you're like, oh, that's kind of funny. But once you get three or four into you, you're it's the maybe one of the funniest shows I've ever seen, uh, which is funny considering how uh, how formulaic it is, almost to a fault. But it's like you still love the characters, and they're just genuinely terrible, terrible people. And of course, Breaking Bad as well, which I only I only got halfway through last night's episode or the other night's episode. Don't tell me what happens. Oh my gosh, yeah, no, Breaking Bad just consistently amazing. Uh, I, I I feel like I've been watching one long movie in several parts. Is the way I feel now. I don't feel like I've caught up to a series, and I'm like, oh yeah, this is season four. It feels different from season three. It's just one long consistent story. And all yeah. I'll say is, I've kind of reached the end of my limit of patience with Walt. <laughs> uh, well, I'm telling you, like, like they have, it's been a systematic uh, attempt to make previously relatable characters yeah. unrelatable. And, and they, they've done that with Walter, and they've done the reverse with, with, with Gus and, uh, and with, well, I mean, they did that with Jesse Pinkman early on. Yeah, yeah, it's a kind of bit of flip-flop there. Andy, anything yeah. to add before we move on? Uh, well, I've actually really been waiting for the league to come back on. I'm a big fan of the league on FX. Hilarious about fantasy football. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, and it's I, absolutely and I've heard, hilarious. I've heard people say it. You don't even have to care about football or play fantasy football to enjoy it. I, I don't like football. I could care less about it. I don't play fantasy football. I think that show is hilarious. Wow. 
Good plug. FX. Usually it's Brian making the FX plugs. So I like that one. Uh, Brian, I'm surprised you don't watch uh, Archer on FX, speaking of. Oh, my gosh. Is... Well, you know, the, the, uh, the folks who do Archer, uh, first of all, that's H. John Benjamin as the voice, yep. who I loved as Coach McGurk. And uh, I believe the team is the same people who did C-Lab 2021 and um, yep. forgot the one that came on after it, uh, that I really enjoyed that one as well. Was it, was you should face? check it out. It's, they're doing like a little mini season right now. It's like four episodes. Very funny. Awesome. So, and um, I think that's that. Uh, Boardwalk Empire started back up on Sunday oh. night. Uh, it was a you, good, that, good that, that's it. That's the one I was all excited. I'm going to have to actually bring back my HBO subscription because uh, I, I did get sucked into Boardwalk Empire, and I am curious what happens next. So I am going to jump back on with that one. Nucky. Nucky's back. <laughs> all right. Uh, let's move on to Interferon. So we could put uh, put a, put this in tube tops too, I guess, because it's YouTube. But uh, a report on Scribble dot com says that YouTube is finalizing paperwork that would allow it to launch a channel featuring regularly scheduled content. It's likely to be the first of more than a dozen such channels. The content would apparently focus on a broad range of themes from sports to fashion. Uh, and they uh, asked for some of the content it plans to include on the channel to be ready within the next two months and is aiming to launch the channel early next year. All of this being passed along from the Wall Street Journal. So it sounds like YouTube is paying content creators to create several million dollars worth of curated content for linear channels that they would program like television, you'd have a, a strip of, of of programming that you would be that would be scheduled to air, so to speak, on YouTube. Well, this this is uh, in step with what they're doing with the YouTube Live experience, and it's actually, I think, a testament to what we're doing here at Twit. I mean, there's a lot of people who watch Twit as a TV channel. They leave it on, they they tune in, they whatever show happens to be on, they watch for a while, and most importantly, they participate in the live chat. And I think that's what they want to capture on YouTube. And I tell you, it, uh, it makes sense, especially think about how young the demographic skews with YouTube. These are people who want to experience media socially. That's the reason that we're seeing uh, the ability to watch movies socially on Facebook. YouTube has the infrastructure and the ability to do that. All they got to do is set up channels. And I think this is exactly what they ought to be doing. Well, and you, that's why I, YouTube coming to Roku makes sense to me. YouTube is already on the Apple TV. Uh, YouTube is available in a lot of these apps on smart TVs. And so I, I think it does make sense for YouTube to try to create themselves as a channel. To, and I think somebody has to do it, whether it's YouTube or someone else, to say we are going to be – uh, an internet channel that competes with the big TV channels. I mean, yes, Twit is an internet channel, and we get a lot of people watching us, but we don't really compete with the TV channels because nobody on TV is doing what we're doing. Uh, right. And what YouTube seems to be saying, and what I think has to happen eventually, is somebody has to go, you know what, we're going to make uh, dramas. We're going to make sitcoms. We're going to make, uh, you know, Bravo TV like reality shows, and we're going to go head to head with this. Andy, do you think it's a good idea, is or is it too early? No, I think they definitely they're they're the right guys to be experimenting with this stuff. Um, I just don't want them to do a copy paste of what you can get on on linear TV today. So I, I want them to be able to break out and do something more unique with it, I, uh, and hopefully that's the the way they'll go. I don't think that there's any problem with that. Uh, I think what, what they're going to do is is do on purpose what I think happens naturally. For example, uh, Scam School drops every Wednesday night at around 9 p.m. Central, and it's amazing how many people just sit there, they go to the Scam School page, and they just keep eating, hitting refresh so that they can be the first. And, of course, they all post the word first and all that annoying stuff. But why not make that an event? Why not have it be it's 9 o'clock on Wednesday night, and let's all tune in together, and there's a chat, and, oh, OMG, we're all watching this together. This is cool. I think there's a place for that. I think that fosters community, and it gives you that social television experience that they, that they need in order to uh, get more credibility. Well, and above and beyond that, if they're talking Wall Street Journal's reporting millions of dollars, that means they might be setting up actual Hollywood-level budgets. Uh, and, I, and I don't see any names attached to this, so I, don't, I, I can't say who is actually going to create this content. But, you know, theoretically, you could get some content that can compete with network-level content. And that would be Absolutely. interesting to see, you know, in an apples-to-apples -apples comparison, whether people do change their behaviors and start watching television on the Internet. When it's like, this isn't about like, oh, well, we're delaying our TV broadcast for eight days. This was made for the Internet. I mean, Netflix has already led the way by commissioning one show, but this sounds like it's a whole network. 
What you know what this also paves the way for is there's a lot of niches that are filled in television that should be filled on YouTube, and this would pave the way for a daily show of the internet on YouTube, or uh, you know all, all the take all the analogs that we have out there in television. They they are regular content released at a regular time. This this can make possible the Tonight Show of YouTube. I yeah, mean, there's right. no reason you couldn't do something like that. Exactly. All right. Uh, we got uh, some webisodes coming in support of The Walking Dead, launching on Monday, October 3rd at 2 p.m. Thanks to Adam12 uh, for sending along the press release about that. Uh, yeah, apparently they just fired off a bunch of stuff. This is the email he sent in to frameratereshow at gmail.com. Six episodes, six webisodes for The Walking Dead are all going to drop at once. They won't, be, uh, they won't be released over time, but Monday, October 3rd at 2 p.m. Eastern at AMC TV. You can watch all the webisodes. I love all this stuff. I love... I love all the, the the Breaking Bad webisodes. If you've never seen those, are fantastic. Uh, I love. This is a great vehicle to get supplements to the bigger story, but that doesn't belong in the big story. That gives you a chance to flesh out characters and that kind of thing. And then finally, I wanted to throw out a uh, a, a note about the International One Minute Movie Festival. I saw this on Wired today. It's the Film Minute. So if you go to filmminute.com. Uh, they pulled in a lineup of 25 short films from 18 countries, including South Africa, Pakistan, Romania, and Argentina. Uh, Argentina? Argentina. Argentina. <laughs> uh, th uh, so, you know, check it out. Five-person jury, which includes Walt Disney Imagineering Vice President of Research and Engineering John Snotty, will select the winner of the Best Film Minute Award and announce the winners. Uh, there's also a People's Choice, so you can vote, and winners will be announced October 6th. So uh, look, I'm not going to say that they are ripping off uh, Twit's own NSFW show, but it, this, this does sound very suspiciously similar to a certain 10-second film festival. Yeah, it's and just believe, six times as long. Well, yes, exactly. They just think that they can throw, they can sextuple the budget of time, and all of a sudden they'll have something new. We're on to you. Sorry. I don't know Jason, what, how we'll put up with how it. How do you, having done a 10-second film festival film for an SFW show, I just don't see how you could fill 60 seconds. Uh, you, you know what? It's these gimmicky teenagers. They yeah. think by having six times as much room, they're going to fill it up. You're just padding it. It's the same story that you tell in 10 seconds. Just taking a whole minute long. All right, let's finish up with some frame rate feedback. Nice job. Yeah, what I was, yeah, what's what happened? Frame back. Feed rate. Same rate oh yeah. Take it away, Brian. Uh, hey, Tom and Brian, I've recently gone to mostly all online streaming. I have an antenna for watching football. Anyway, I was wondering if there's a good way of keeping track of all the online streaming available, such as Hulu as well as CBS.com and other online streaming options. I have Play On, but it would be good to have a way of queuing up from multiple sources. Hmm. Any suggestions? Man, this is, we always want that. As soon as everything fragments, we want one thing to manage all of it at once. We want a trillion for our online videos. Yeah, it's a... Uh... Uh, I, I'm not sure exactly what he's asking. Uh, side reel is a great way to track down where you can find all of the stuff, whether it's streaming or whether it's available for download. Clicker is another way of doing that, yep. uh, which right. is a good one. But it sounds like he wants an, something to organize it and queue it up. Uh, and if that's the case, I'm not sure what to tell him. Yeah, uh, there's one other thing that popped in here because we had so much other news. We didn't do a lot of uh, user submission stuff. However, I wanted to show this. This is a billboard that's up in England that equates piracy to terrorism. Uh, and it says here, I'm going to, my, my video card's freaking out again. But it says here, a bomb won't go off here because weeks before, the criminal pirating films was caught by monitoring his internet history. Pirating films fu funds terrorism and organized crime. <laughs> Report it today. Call the confidential anti-terrorist hotline. Does now, pirating films fund terrorism? Uh, sure, I can say that. How but, does someone taking and ripping a DVD illegally and put it up on BitTorrent for no money fund anything? Uh, what, are you supporting the terrorists? Is that what you... Is yeah, that I know. Just... Well, that's the problem with this kind of stuff, right? You you set up the argument once so one-sided that, you know, it's like saying child pornographers are terrorists. Well, if you oppose us in any way, you obviously support the terrorists. Uh, some people are shouting fake in the chat room. Others are shouting old. So uh, if you got fake uh, and old. I, there we I go. Don't... That makes me feel better. Those two internet standbys. It's either fake or old. Fake old. Uh, tell us which one it is. Um, Internet. Uh, Andy, do you, do you uh, have a guess? Hopefully it's fake. I think <laughs> it's both. 
<laughs> All right, that's it for this episode of Frame Rate. Thank you, Andy Beach, uh, for joining us. We didn't we didn't make as good a use of your video. <laughs> like codec brain uh as i would like we just didn't have the story so we will definitely want to have you back uh on the show if you'll have us because i know you know a lot about the nuts and bolts of how this stuff works but but thanks for uh for joining us and and sharing the your wisdom with us let folks know where they can find what you do online uh these days i'm mostly writing at the video and on twitter at video uprising and then at at andy beach i post pictures of my daughter and random cocktails Ooh, nice but not those are separate pictures, right? Typically, she's taking the picture of me with the cocktail. Okay, good. Uh, check that out. Thank you, Andy Beach. And uh, Brian Brushwood, a pleasure as always. Dude, freaking fantastic time. I got I to gotta replace this video card. There's like a thunderstorm behind me crashing. And while this is happening, my video card is overheating or something. I got to replace it. So, like, my screen's just going, bee, 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 and the behind me is thundering and all that stuff. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get out of here now okay. while I still can. Post-apocalyptic scenario for Brian Brushwood. That's it for this episode of Frame Rate. Email us, show at gmail.com. We'll see you next time. It's not time for another big story, though. I, I no, swear. That's the, it's time for the end of the show. It's Hold the, on. We're here. looping back in time. <laughs>